Well, good evening. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, I'd like to welcome you all to the Baker Institute, and uh, I think it should be a very interesting evening. Uh, all of you are certainly familiar with the fact that we have a space station flying tonight uh, with a crew of six on board. And the space station, I think, is just about complete now. Uh, it's been built and assembled by the space shuttle. And uh, certainly when we started off, it was going to be not only built and assembled by the space shuttle, but it would be supported by the space shuttle. And then in 2004, the president decided that he would end the space shuttle program in 2010 and uh, have the space station complete. And uh, then it was subsequently decided by the new president that we would operate the space station till 2020, uh, which leaves us uh, in a situation where you're not having the, the space shuttle supporting the station. And uh, it started an effort to uh, go ahead and have the station supported by commercial enterprises commercial startup companies uh, that would uh, get spacecraft that would transport cargo and uh, maybe eventually uh, crew members up to the space station. But uh, in the budget that was uh, released yesterday, uh, the funding for some of those spacecraft is going to be reduced apparently. And it looks like those spacecraft are uh, not going to make the schedule that uh, had originally been hoped for. And in the interim, uh, we're going to be uh, flying our astronauts up to the space station on the space on the Soyuz spacecraft, and we'll be supported by the Progress, the Russian Progress vehicle, and the automated transfer vehicle that uh, the Europeans have and the ones that the Japanese have. But none of those vehicles and none of these commercial cargo vehicles that are envisioned have the capability of the space shuttle, which can take up 60,000 pounds and also have a significant uh, down mass. So it's going to be a question of really how you can operate the space station and effectively do the science that we want to do uh, without that up mass and the down mass. Uh, back in 1995, uh, the administrator of NASA asked Chris Kraft to head up a committee, the Space Shuttle Management Independent Review Committee, to look at how we could reduce the operational costs of flying the shuttle uh, and come up with a management structure to do that. And Chris Kraft organized a group of people uh, from experts from industry uh, and bus the business world and came up with uh, a recommendation that led to having a single prime contractor who would be responsible for operations of the space shuttle. And uh, that was decided back in 95. And uh, the United Space Alliance was formed as a company at that time between Rockwell and Lockheed Martin to uh, take on that contract, and it was awarded to them in November 1995. And since that time, uh, they have been operating the space shuttle and uh, have done a very good job of doing that. And uh, one of the recommendations that was made by the review committee of uh, Dr. Kraft was uh, that after that single prime contract uh, had a chance to develop and mature, that uh, the government should con get con give consideration to privatizing the shuttle. And certainly, as we look at uh, the efforts of, that are being under undertaken today uh, to commercialize space activities, privatization of the space shuttle uh, makes a lot of sense. So we have this evening with us uh, Dan Brandenstein, the Executive Vice President of United Space Alliance, and uh, Howard DeCastro, also uh, a vice president and the program manager from the United Space Alliance. And uh, they're going to talk to us about a proposal to do just that. And uh, let me turn it over to Dan Brandenstein, uh, who is a veteran astronaut from, from the shuttle program, has flown it four times and headed up the astronaut office uh, from 1987 to 1992 and has been in industry since that time. Well, Dan? Well, thank you, George. And uh, for everybody that uh, saw the brochures and uh, thought that uh, Ginger Barnes, our CEO, was going to be here uh, with the budget just coming out, uh, she uh, got called up to Washington. And uh, so I am here uh, 
replacing her. She uh, sends her apologies, but uh, she's uh, got important things to do when the budget comes out because usually it keeps you pretty busy for a few days. Uh, as, as George mentioned, the United Space Alliance uh, was, uh, was formed to operate the shuttle. Uh, it uh, was uh, the pulling together of 31 other contracts uh, that were individually managed by NASA at that point in time uh, to make a, a more efficient uh, space operations. And uh, since then, uh, we have uh, been operating the shuttle uh, and uh, we uh, believe uh, quite effectively. The, uh, and through that time frame, there have been a number of times where it has been looked at a ways to possibly commercialize uh, the space shuttle and uh, and uh, hand it off to a commercial entity, which would have been uh, United Space Alliance. Uh, that never materialized uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, and uh, to this day uh, we are uh, flying it uh, with uh, NASA as our, our primary customer. Uh, Howard DeCastro, uh, who has been the program manager uh, throughout uh, the life uh, of the shuttle at USA, uh, has uh, been there and, and running the program, and, and we've watched uh, uh, the shuttle uh, be uh, recover from uh, an accident. Uh, we've uh, seen it uh, be recertified and uh, and upgraded uh, as we go along, and uh, feel that it uh, it still has uh, some legs on it, and uh, we would like to con see it continue to fly. Uh, However, uh, with uh, the various administrations and uh, their plans, uh, that uh, is uh, not the case uh, as it stands today. And uh, so uh, Howard uh, will uh, give you a, a rundown of uh, a variety of things that we have done and have seen in the shuttle uh, over that time frame. And uh, with that, uh, once again, thanks a lot. I'll turn it over to you, Howard. Howard, uh, as Dan mentioned, has been the program manager at uh, USA for a considerable period of time, and before that time was with uh, Northwest Airlines and uh, was in uh, support of training activities in Northwest Airlines and support of training activities in the military and had a very distinguished career in the military in the Marine Corps uh, and retired after uh, 24 years. So, Howard, let me turn it over to you. My company doesn't let me speak very often. <laughs> when they do, it, it's been my experience that I get more applause at the introduction than I do after I've completed my talk. <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll see how it goes here today. Could I just see a show of hands of those people in the audience who have never in their life worked in human spaceflight? Oh my goodness. So just put them back up if you expect to never work in human spaceflight. <laughs> Still quite a number of you. I'm glad you're here. Uh, most of this crowd, people that, uh, that I know, people that I've met, people that I've heard about who have worked in human spaceflight for a long time. We'll, uh, there's been a recent increase in the possibility of the shuttle flying as a commercial venture after we finish these next three missions. To support that possibility, recently United Space Alliance uh, reacted to a solicitation by NASA for its Commercial Crew Development 2 proposal, CCDEV2, and we put in a proposal to ask if we could further study and refine the way we would use the shuttle in a commercial model. Now, I'm not going to talk about that proposal tonight because NASA is in the process of evaluating our proposal and a number of other proposals that have been submitted. And it would be absolutely inappropriate for me to stand up here and market it to you and, and uh, while this, this evaluation process is going on. But what I can tell you is that continued operation of the space shuttle is possible, or to be a little more positive, it's quite feasible. Orbiters have significant additional service life. The vehicle certification that was recommended by the CAIB, the Columbia Accident Investigation Board, has been completed by NASA and by the prime contractors. And NASA has even gone beyond that certification to make sure that the orbiter, the, the uh, 
engines, the rockets, and the tanks can fly additional missions. The primes are all ready to support Alliant Technology, Lockheed Martin with the tanks, Pratt Whitney Rocketdyne, United Space Alliance, Boeing, our major sub. They're ready to go forward with this proposal if asked to do so. The vendors that you hear about that have gone offline are ready to support. We have lost some vendors, but we have not lost any critical vendors. The closest we've come, I would tell you, is a company called Degusa. Degusa provides the waterproofing for the tile on the orbiters. And Degusa was going to shut down its waterproofing manufacturing operation at the, the first of this year. But when they heard we might have the opportunity to fly longer, they are keeping it, keeping it open at their expense. Now, it wouldn't be a big thing. We could buy all the waterproofing we need to go for many years, but it has a one-year shelf life. So we have to keep that, that <coughs> manufacture online. We need 17-inch disconnects that connect the orbiter to the tank. Uh, we have stopped manufacturing those, but we have 16 of them. We were just getting ready to scrap them the other day, but we have decided that we will hold those. We'll ship them. <laughs> Oops, I was just told to zip my lip here. <laughs> okay. we're, going, we're going to keep those so we can use them if it's necessary to de do so. Uh, the shuttle team itself. Absolutely magnificent, working better together today than it has ever worked in the past, and they are more than willing to continue operations if asked to do so. Now, there are some issues that have to be resolved if the shuttles were operated commercially. I mentioned Degusa, got that one solved. We're looking at the other long-term buys, but the external tanks are going to take a while to get back into production, as will the solid rocket motors. Lockheed Martin builds the external tanks at Michoud, up in Mississippi. Uh, months ago, the tooling, months ago they, they manufactured the last tank and shipped it. All the tanks that we're going to use for these next three missions are down at the Cape now. There are no more tanks in a completed phase. There are some parts. There's one tank that was built some time ago that's sitting there and could be refurbished. It's a lightweight, not a super lightweight tank, but it's, it's usable. There are parts for a couple of other tanks, but you'd have to start buying material to get back into operation. And more than that, the tooling has been set aside. It's still there. It's under canvas. It could be used, but it would take time to reinstate it and the workforce has been let go. Now you have to rehire all those that you can, rehire or hire new people if you can't get the old ones back. You have to retrain, you have to recertify, and we're about 18 months away from the next external tank, the next ET. Much of the same has happened at ATK. They have a similar situation where they've stopped pouring the solid rocket motors but they're not, it wouldn't take them as long to get back online as it will take the tank. So they're enveloped by that 18 months. And given the go-ahead, they're ready to move forward, bring their workers back, make sure the certification is still good, pour new segments, and give us solid rocket motors. Something to point out, even though that 18 months seems like a long time, is that gap is shorter than the gap we will experience waiting for the new capability to come online, <coughs> the new ability to fly humans in space. So given that it's feasible to operate the shuttle, let me talk a little bit about where we are on completing the manifest. And, and again, I would tell you that uh, safety is paramount here. Uh, the NASA contractor team is well on its way to safe completion of these three missions. Discovery is out on pad A. The Kennedy Space Center ready for launch is STS-133 on 24 February. Now the, the ATV slipped today. It was to launch from Peru. And because it slipped, we have to slip out to the 25th. If it doesn't fly tomorrow, we would have to slip out to the 26th. But if it goes beyond Friday, we would come back to the 24th. 
It's just the way things work. So we'll probably uh, fly on the 25th or maybe move back to the 24th. Discovery, by the way, has only flown 39 times. It has 61 missions remaining on its original 100 mission life. Endeavor is in the orbiter processing uh, facility in Bay 2. It's ready to roll over to the vehicle assembly building. It's going to go over on the 28th of this month, the last day of the month. And then about nine days later, it will have been mated to the external tank and the solid rockets, and it'll be ready to roll out to the pad. And its launch is scheduled at the moment for April 19th. We always put a not earlier than because things happen. And uh, we want to work toward a date, no pressure, but you work toward a date, and we often make that date, sometimes because of weather or recently we had a mechanical problem with the external tank that I'll talk about. Uh, that, that slips it out a little. Atlantis, which already has been advertised as having flown its last mission, gets to fly its real last mission. <laughs> and if we go commercial, it won't be its real last mission, so we'll hope. Uh, it's in OPF Bay 1, on track for the STS-135 launch, not earlier than the 28th of June. And if the funds are there to move that launch out a little later, maybe to the July or August time frame, that would be even more beneficial for the International Space Station because they would have more time to decide exactly what kind of logistics, what kind of spare parts, what kind of load you'd want to put on that vehicle. Talk a little bit about the NASA contractor team. It's working exceptionally well to prepare the vehicles, to train the crews and get them ready and get the payloads ready to go for the missions. The team's approach to risk mitigation is really robust. I think it would stand up to any scrutiny. There's been a lot of talk in the last couple of years about risk mitigation, about the shuttle being unsafe, about uh, probability risk assessment and loss of vehicles. But I would tell you that the team is working tremendously well together and they understand the level of risk. And an, exe an excellent example, in my opinion, is what's going on right now as we work through the issue on the stringer cracks on the external tank. I think if the Columbia Accident Investigation Board or the Aerospace Advisory Panel, Safety Advisory Panel, or the Augustine Panel, or any watchdog agency anywhere had the opportunity to observe the process that NASA has led to understand and deal with the risk associated with the ET stringer cracks, they'd be impressed, they'd be more than satisfied with the testing, with the analysis, with the discussion, with the detail that people have gone into, and the decision that is yet to be made, but will be made a little bit tomorrow at the, the requirements board, a little bit more at the agency FRR that is scheduled for next week. The performance of the orbiter has steadily improved. It's improved through the life of the program. It's a much different vehicle than it was in 1981 when Bob Crippen and uh, John went up on their mission. It's always been solid from an aerodynamic standpoint, but now the electronics and many of the systems have been replaced and refurbished. The wiring has, has been refurbished and the vehicles are extremely well known. The performance, has the, the performance has increased as noted by a dramatic decrease in orbiter anomalies, that is problems that we see on the orbiters before flight and in in-flight anomalies that go through the whole system. They have come down dramatically <coughs> over the years. The space shuttle main engines have always operated flawlessly. Pratt-Whitney Rocketdynes made steady improvements in those, in the robustness of the turbines and in the engines overall. Since the repair of the field joint on the solid rocket booster, those have performed nominally. Losing Challenger was a, a terrible event, but it led ATK to fully understand those rockets, make them better, and every mission since then has seen flawless performance. The shedding of the foam from the external tank caused the loss, the damage to the orbiter and the loss of Columbia coming back in after its mission. The work in return to flight has given the crew a much better understanding of the tank 
and the loss of foam, the improvements to the tanks to limit the, the loss of foam, uh, the ability to assess the condition of the orbiter on ASNET and once it's on orbit, and the uh, ability to keep the crew aboard the International Space Station if the orbiter is determined unfit for return, dramatically reduce the risk to the crew. One of the problems in flying longer, even in completing the last three missions, has been can we retain the workforce? Can we retain the people we need with the critical skills? The plans that NASA and the contractors have put in place have been very effective in keeping the workforce that are necessary to complete the mission. At the heart of that retention is the fact that people who work on the shuttle program want to stay to complete the mission. They are proud of what they do. They're proud of the shuttle, proud of human spaceflight, and they strongly believe in the value of the program, and that belief is evident in their focus and their dedication. They care about human spaceflight. They care about the shuttle program. They care about the safety of the astronauts. They care about each other, and they're tremendously proud that they are part of making history. So now I'm going to talk about the commercial shuttle, and I'm going to put it in the context of NASA's strategic plan. That strategic plan came out just yesterday. Can I see a show of hands of those who have read it completely through? Ah, I see one, two, three, four. <laughs> this is good. It came out about noon. That's good work. The first goal. It has six goals, and we're only going to talk about the first goal and the three sub-goals. The first goal is to extend and sustain human activities across the solar system. The three sub-goals, the first one much longer than up here, I'm going to read it to you, sustain the operation and full use of the International Space Station and expand efforts to utilize the ISS as a national laboratory for scientific, technological, diplomatic, and educational purposes and for supporting future objectives in human space exploration. That's very broad. Scientific, technological, diplomatic, educational, and to support future objectives in human exploration. The second is to develop competitive opportunities for the commercial community to provide best value products and services to low Earth orbit and beyond. And the third is to develop an integrated architecture and capabilities for safe crewed and cargo missions beyond low Earth orbit. In other words, to maintain control of the exploration mission. Now, I think commercial operation of the space shuttle is only feasible if first we successfully fly the next three missions and second, if it fits nicely into this set of goals, it has to further these goals. So we'll look at those goals one by one. The first is full use of the ISS. Now I've gone to the ISS program manager at NASA hoping that he would tell me we have to have the shuttle. If we don't have the shuttle, we will not be able to operate the ISS at full utilization. That's not the answer I got at all. As you would expect, NASA has worked very hard and done a tremendous job to figure out how they are going to operate the shuttle through 2020, utilizing the assets that are available and the budget that they have. Now their plans rely on the continued operation of the Russian Soyuz for human transport, and they rely on the Russian Progress, Europe's ATV, Japan's HTV for logistics support. The plan also relies on SpaceX Dragon and the orbital Cygnus logistic carriers meeting their initial operating capacity on time and then meeting their projected launch schedule. And as George pointed out earlier, both of these programs are behind their development schedule. So that's a little bit of a soft spot. There's no question that continued availability of the space shuttle would increase the probability of full utilization of the ISS throughout its life. 
Operation of the shuttle would provide backup for logistics and personnel transport, would increase the assurance ISS would be capable of reaching full utilization, especially in the near term when SpaceX and Orbital are still trying to get their, their vehicles operational and prove their capability. Shuttle operations also would provide the capability to add a seventh crew member to the ISS crew. Now, why do we want seven crew members? Why would that be good? First of all, why can you only have six? You can only have as many crew members as you have immediate rescue for them. So two Soyuz, three people per Soyuz, you can have six people on board. The six people on board already are very taxed to do all of the work to maintain the International Space Station and complete the science they would like to complete. Having a seventh crew member or having the shuttle that could take several crew members up and work for 14 days would dramatically increase the ability to provide science. So shuttle would provide additional personnel transport and a rescue capability. It would provide up mass and down mass that would enhance the crew's capability to conduct research. It could carry the multi-purpose logistics modules, the MPLMs, it could carry the space hab module, which would dramatically improve science up and down mask, would be able to take up the racks that only the shuttle can take up through space hab and bring back the racks. Shuttle would also provide additional crew transport for the international partners, and this supports the diplo diplomatic mission. The international partners will be very short of seats over the next 10 years. NASA's second sub-goal is to support commercial operations. Making the transition to NASA, from NASA managed space operation to commercial operations won't be an easy task. We're used to working in a, in a NASA run paradigm. George said earlier that, uh, that United Space Alliance has been managing the shuttle program. Uh, that's, that's not true. NASA manages the shuttle program. NASA has the shuttle program manager. It maintains control of the keyboards and panels. United Space Alliance provides the backup, the majority of the engineers, the majority of the technical people and professional people to NASA, but we do it under contract to NASA. That transition from NASA managing and running that program to allowing a contractor to fly into low Earth orbit is going to take time. And it would be a lot better, a lot faster, a lot smarter, and a lot more effective to make that step using a vehicle that is as well known as the shuttle, that is reliable as the shuttle, that is proven like the shuttle, and both sides, the contractor side and the government side, understand it extremely well. It will be far more difficult to do that with a new entry program that is yet, as yet unproven. Funding. NASA doesn't have enough money to do everything it would like to do. Isn't that the way, always? Helping to solve the near-term bu budget issues, uh, we might be able to help by making a commercial investment up front get the tanks back on the line, get the solid rocket motors back in production, uh, do the things that it takes to get ready for the next shuttle flight and do it on our nickel, then charge NASA flight by flight over a period of time to recoup that investment. Now nobody makes an investment thinking they're gonna lose money. You make an investment based on an agreement that you can recoup not only your investment, but make a profit. So we would be looking for some period of time, seven years is, is what we were looking at initially, and a couple of flights a year, and the possibility to use the shuttle in other commercial ways that might bring revenue in. We're still working on that business case. Believe me, we are by no means there. I wish I could, I wish I could get deep pockets today to say we were and we'd just get on with it but uh, it's something we have yet to do. But providing upfront investment for commercial shuttle 
would not only allow NASA to pay for launches as they come, but it would allow them to continue to budget to support the other commercial ventures that are coming along and hopefully leave money for the exploration vehicles, the family of vehicles that has to come along to support the next goal. And the next goal is exploration beyond LEO. I'll read it to you again. To develop an integrated architecture and capabilities for safe crewed and cargo missions beyond low Earth orbit. Now, this is going to require a family of rockets and vehicles to support the exploration missions. And you know that we were on a path some years back to have Ares 1 and Ares 5. Uh, we're no longer on that path. Among the rockets under consideration is a shuttle-derived side mount and a shuttle-derived inline vehicle. NASA has worked in detail for the last three years to develop a concept to fly the shuttle-derived vehicles. They have looked at it very carefully. They have interacted with the commercial companies. They have looked at all the centers and talked to, to the various centers to make sure that people understood the concept and, and had their input. And it turns out that both these vehicles, the side mount and the inline, would meet the requirements for returning to low Earth orbit, to the moon, to near Earth, op near -earth objects, and even to Mars exploration. As an example, and I'm not going to go into great detail here, but the side mount takes just under 80 metric tons to LEO and about 50 metric tons to lunar insertion using a four-segment solid rocket booster. It can build its lift capability over the block, uh, block changes to over 130 metric tons to LEO with a five-segment booster and an upper stage. Gives you all the lift capacity that you would need. The shuttle-derived vehicles appear to be lower in cost and have an earlier initial operating capability did, than did Ares 5 or than do any of the other heavy lift vehicles that are under consideration. So from my point of view, at least, it makes sense to use proven hardware and technology where it meets NASA's requirements and where it takes advantage of known systems, available facilities, a seasoned workforce, and is cheaper and faster to develop a new system than developing a new system. The case for continued shuttle operations, commercial or NASA managed, becomes much stronger if NASA makes a choice for exploration to use one of the shuttle-derived vehicles. These fit together beautifully. Workforce, facilities, tank, rockets, engines, it's just so logical that I, I have a hard time not understanding why people aren't jumping on it and making it happen. But if NASA chooses another path and doesn't take advantage of shuttle manufacturing capabilities and the workforce for the boosters, the main engines, the external tank and the facilities and the workforce for assembly and launch of the vehicle, then I would tell you that the case for flying the shuttle any longer is extremely weak. It's NASA's decision, no question about it. NASA owns human spaceflight. The country needs NASA to own human spaceflight, whether they do it under a commercial model or under their own model. So they need to ask themselves these questions. Do you need the shuttle to get full utilization of the ISS? Does extended use of the shuttle dovetail with the next vehicle? and then make sense. Can the cost of the shuttle be low enough to leave funds, develop other NASA priorities, or is it prohibitive? Does the development of the commercial paradigm become safer and easier if shuttles used for that development? And do the advantages add up to make a compelling case to allow shuttle use in a commercial model? I think the advantages add up. We'll see what NASA decides. Thank you. Thank you, Art. Uh, 
I would point out that as you look at the logistics on the shuttle, uh, when the shuttle and the station were put together, the whole concept on science was uh, replacing the racks. And if you look at the space station hatches, they were designed because of the size of a rack, they're as large as they are. So the only vehicle that can really fulfill that, uh, that concept is the shuttle because you can't take any of those racks up in any of these commercial vehicles or the ATV or the Progress or anything else that's being talked about. The other factor I think that enters into this is if the commercials are late, uh, that impacts it greatly. And uh, you might recollect that when we had the Columbia tragedy, we had a crew of three on board the space station. And because we didn't have enough water to support three crewmen, we had to reduce the size of the crew to two. You're operating now with six. And when you talk about the logistics support not being there from the shuttle, uh, you're probably going to end up having to reduce the crew size. As uh, NASA said yesterday uh, when they were talking about the delay in the commercial vehicles, that the crew size might have to be uh, reduced. And that certainly makes it very competitive as far as what astronauts will be going up to the station and that you've got the Americans and the Europeans and the Japanese all, all competing for a ride with the Russians on a Russian vehicle. <clears throat> so it, uh, logistics wise, it's going to be a challenge without the shuttle and uh, very difficult to do. Uh, I think uh, Howard is quite right. I did not mean to say that NASA is not managing the uh, shuttle program. And as a matter of fact, the next gentleman who's going to speak uh, was the individual who uh, really managed the shuttle program from right its inception right through to its first flight. Uh, Bob Thompson had a very distinguished career in the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, the predecessor of NASA. Uh, he had a great career in NASA uh, from Mercury on, and uh, certainly uh, did a great job as a program manager on the space shuttle program. So let me turn it over to Bob. One of the things I'd first like to do is look at my watch and see, and I think we were supposed to be here till at least 7.30, so we got 45 minutes. Uh, I wouldn't bring my wife tonight because I didn't want her sitting here criticizing me <laughs> or trying to keep me from using bad words. And every now and then she's reading the paper and she quits reading it and she says to me, why are they shutting the shuttle down? And I said, I don't know. I've been trying to figure it out myself. She says, you mean you don't know? I said, no, I don't know. She says, well, it says here it's unsafe. Do you think it's unsafe? I say, I don't think it's unsafe. It's risky, but it's not unsafe. So she goes on reading. A few days later, hey, here's why they're shutting the shuttle down. It's too old. I said, well, it means too old. Well, it says the aging space shuttle. Reading the paper all the time. I said, well, I don't understand that. Hell of a lot of it's new every time we fly. <laughs> and the orbiters are basically aluminum airplanes, and they sit in an air-conditioned hangar all the time. Man, it hardly ever makes a landing compared to commercial airplanes that make 30 or 40 a day. It's not old. She's reading a few days later. Oh, here's why they're shutting the shuttle down. They can't afford it. I said, what the hell do you mean they can't afford it? They're getting more money now than they've gotten in a long time. Been afforded it for 30 years. What's happened? I don't know what they say. They can't afford it. I said, well, they don't know what the hell they're doing. <laughs> and she says, how come you're so smart and they're so dumb? <laughs> I know I've got her. I said, I don't have a good answer for that. <laughs> so if anyone in the crowd wants to ask me why you're shutting the shuttle down, I'm serious. It has not been studied. There is no rationale presented by the U.S. government that says why the shuttle has been shut down. And I'll challenge anyone to tell me where it is. Howard asked how many people work for NASA. I'd like to know how many people are 70 years or younger. 
Raise your hand. I'd say the vast majority. So you're the youngsters. If you're 70 and under, you're a youngster. <laughs> I was sitting working at the Langley Research Center doing basic aeronautical research work. And a national policy got made. The Russians put a little satellite in orbit. It went beep, beep, beep. The country got excited and said, we're going to get in the space program. We're going to put a man in space. We're going to change NACA to NASA, give you the space mission. A few days later, someone asked me if I wanted to go join the space task group. To be honest with you, I think what they're trying to do was get rid of research people that weren't very good and put them in the space task group. <laughs> My space task group colleagues won't agree with that. They think they took the good people and put them in the space task group. I don't know the answer to that either. <laughs> but we had a national space policy that says we're going to get in space and we're going to put people in space. Basic national space policy, 1958, Eisenhower administration. Changed my life. I got moved from Virginia, where I grew up, to this godforsaken place called Texas. <laughs> and I learned to live in Texas. Pretty good place. We started spending money. Old NACA, our budget didn't even show it to national level. But now, hell, we got a new job to put people in space, so we got money. We start building a mercury capsule, start building a Gemini capsule. We're doing pretty well, except President Kennedy got up and said, we'll show the Russians, we'll go to the moon and back. Jesus Christ, we hadn't looked at going to the moon and back. <laughs> but if he says we'll go to the moon and back, we'll go to the moon and back. Okay. Hey, hey, here's a German down Fort Bliss that's been moved down to Huntsville, Alabama that can maybe help. And here are a bunch of aeronautical people from Langley that maybe can help. Let's figure out how to go to the moon and back. We'll take that rocket guy and put him in NASA. Well, that rocket guy likes to build big rockets. So he said, we'll go to the moon and back. We'll build a Nova-class rocket. Whew. Saturn V is pretty small compared to a Nova-class rocket. But there were a couple of engineers at Langley, not even in the space task group, that said, hey, dummies, if you do lunar orbit rendezvous, you don't need a Nova. Well, of course, the big Nova people didn't like that. But the more you looked at the argument, we didn't need the damn Nova. We settled on a Saturn V, one vehicle. We didn't even have to do Earth orbit, except to get on the right trajectory. And with the Saturn V and the command module and the service module, we fulfilled the commitment. Basic space policy, go to the moon and back. I'll show you the funding effect. And here's what I'm going to get down when I get serious and talk. <laughs> I'm telling you, you go through some reactions to national policy, and how in the hell do you sort them out? I was sitting at home, fully retired. It's now 2004. And Dot says, hey, there's going to be a speech at NASA. This is after the Challenger. I go turn it on. And here's a Texas colleague of mine named George Bush. He gets up and announces, we're going to go back to the moon and on to Mars. I said, whew, what a change in policy. But now I'm retired, no one's going to move me to Texas. I'm already in Texas. But let me show you some of these things on a national budget level. And I'm telling you, the decision that was made in 2004 was a bad decision. And the decision that's being made by the current administration to back up that decision in 2004 is even worse. Now let me get on the budget. I'm going to talk about the federal budget, talk about the shuttle configuration, and I'm going to say a few things about safety. And then I guess we're going to have a question and answer period. Oh, George, excuse me, George. George's going to toss you. I've got to leave George some time. Let's look at the budget. Oh, I'm supposed to punch this thing. Eh? 
Here we go. That's a funny looking continuity of budget, isn't it? On the bottom, we go from 1958, when I was sitting at Langley behaving myself, to the day out here to right. The national budget for NASA and the area under that curve is everything that NASA does. It's a space stuff that has to do with man, it's space stuff that has to do with unmanned, and the space stuff that has to do with flying airplanes in lower space. Now this thing is in percent of federal budget. And you can say, well, hell, the budget's bigger now. So a percent of the budget today is a hell of a lot more than it was in 1958. That's true. More actual dollars. But the percent of the budget is what the 500 members in Congress see. They have to uh, judge the whole budget. And when you get 1%, and he gets 1%, and he gets 1%, and you say, I need 2%, give me his 1%, that doesn't happen. So the percent says what the people in Congress think about what you're doing. And despite what you read in the paper this morning, when the president released his budget, that's just the start of the process. The president ain't got any money. The money comes out of the appropriations channel of the Congress, not the authorization channel. The authorization people in Congress can get them to say anything they want to. And our politicians that are on the authorization thing can make you think she's doing a great job until the money comes out of the appropriation channel, you ain't going anywhere. Now, let me show you what else is on this chart. I got moved from operations. I was talking to George a little earlier, and George is primarily an operations guy at NASA. I worked in operations a while, and then I got over into program development management. So I corrected George on a couple of his terms and he said, well, you used to be in operations. I said, yeah, but I outgrew that. <laughs> you see the peak of that curve? 1966. We're spending nearly 5% of the federal budget. We, NASA. That's when they put me in charge of future planning. You see what happened? Went to hell from that point on. <laughs> we had plans to go to Mars. We had plans to go to Pluto. We had plans to build Werner Love, great big rotating space stations and shuttles flying to it and from it all the time. Werner never saw a big vehicle he didn't like. The bigger, the better. We would have taken that damn curve to 50% of the national budget if you'd left us alone. Guarantee you, we had plans to spend 50% of the national budget. I go around and I hear people say, Damn it, we'd be on Mars if that damn Richard Nixon hadn't cut the program down. Poor old Richard gets blamed for a hell of a lot of stuff, <laughs> but he isn't the man to cut the program down. The program was cut down from 5% to where you can see where Johnson handed the job over to Nixon. We were already back down to 2%. The Johnson administration turned off the heavy spending in space. When Nixon came in, we were still struggling with where we go post-Apollo. And I was participating in a lot of arguments at that time on what became known as Skylab. And we got that pretty well sorted out. We got Werner off of his wet workshop and we got the program going pretty well. Bob Gilruth called me one day and said, I want to take you off of Skylab and put you over here on shuttle. So I go over and join the shuttle program in 1970. See the chart. We were down to about 2%. I start working on the shuttle program. A lot of things about the vehicle I didn't like. A lot of things about the funding that weren't successful. We had to get the vehicle and the funding and something would give the NASA and the manned space flight a future. We did that between 70 and 72. 72, we settled on the shuttle, and I'm going to tell you some of that story. Now, the budget is down today. In today's budget, 
that the president released, the NASA portion of that budget is 0.05%, one half of 1% of the federal budget that the president is requesting for NASA today. It's just about $19 billion. In my opinion, if I were president, I'd cut NASA two more billion dollars. I'd cut them down to 16 or 17 billion. And with 17 billion dollars or 16 billion dollars, they can still run the shuttle, they can run the space station, they can do the six billion that they're planning to do in the unmanned program and aeronautics, and we can have a very good ongoing manned space flight and NASA program at 16 to 17 billion. I'll be glad to debate anyone in the country on that. Having said that, NASA will probably survive over the next few years at somewhere between 0.5 and 0.4 percent of the federal budget. They ain't going to get 19 billion when the dust clears, in my judgment. I hope I'm wrong. They better plan on being down to 16 or 17. And I think they can have, look what we did down, let me go back and talk about Nixon a little bit. We were trying to figure out where we go from Apollo 70 to 72. Nixon kept saying, I don't care what you do, get it down to 1% or less, and I and my administration will support you as long as you can show me how you're going to get down to 1% or less. Because I think if you'll get down to 1% or less, the Congress and the nation will kind of leave you alone and let you do what should be done in space. But if you ramp up here like that spike, you can get your head cut off. We have stayed 1% or less through building the shuttle, through building the space station, through operating all the telescopes like Hubble and so forth that look outward, running the aeronautics that been run in NASA at less than 1% of the national budget. We can do it. We've done it for 30 years. NASA doesn't need more money. They just need to get their damn program straightened out, get their priorities straightened out. Let me talk about this, and bear with me on this chart. And there's going to be a, I'm going to give you a test after I finish here, so pay attention. <laughs> we always talk about what is our path to deep space. I, I, I want to I go to deep space. I was walking out of a parking lot here a few years ago and ran into an ex-Apollo astronaut. And I won't mention his name, but we got to talking. And he began to challenge me, well, why did you build that dumbass shuttle? It doesn't do anything but go around in circles. And I said, what do you mean, go around in circles? The shuttle can take things to space. It can put telescopes in space. It can build space stations. It can build industrial parks. It can bring stuff down. That's no good. I, I, want, I want to go to Mars. It won't go to Mars. I said, well, why do you want to go to Mars? He says, I want to explore. I said, what do you mean by explore? Well, I want to go step on something no one else has stepped on. I said, hell, that's not exploring. Why not go to space and explore how to live, how to work, how to manufacture things, how to contribute to the economy? Well, that's not exploring. I said, I think so. I'd like to go explore how to live in space. That's not exploring. I want to go... He finally did stop the argument. He says, you got to tell me to go somewhere. I thought, boy, I'm about to tell you to go somewhere. <laughs> True story. In any event, on the left over there, it says energy, but it's really cost. I don't know how many people in here took high school physics. My colleague here, Dick Allen, didn't take high school physics, but he's heard this a lot of times, so that's all right. If you're taking high school physics, you can follow me. Over there is both the kinetic energy and the potential energy it takes to do things. And the higher you are on that curve, the more it costs. 
And it's not a linear curve because as you go on up higher, it gets costlier and costlier. Over this way, you see distance from the Earth, and that's not linear either. Way to the left, you see I put 300 miles. The shuttle will go anywhere up to 600 miles, but it won't go to the moon. It wasn't designed to go to the moon. As you work up and down that left chart over there, you have to spend energy both going up and coming down. There's no free path over there. The shuttle, we use chemical propulsion to go up, and we leave, use a little bit of chemical propulsion to start down, and then we got those great big dumb looking wings and the whole part of the vehicle, and we convert that energy to heat. And we throw the heat away, and we come down and land on a runway. Well, you don't have to do that. You can land out in the goddamn ocean with a parachute. Or you can land in flatlands of Russia with a parachute. Trouble if you land in an ocean with a parachute, if you're not careful, you'll drown after it's all over with. It's a nice place to land, but it's not a very good place to swim around. I, I don't know, I haven't been on around the Russian people landing in ships, but the shuttle comes back and lands like an airplane. No one seems to be interested in it anymore. Hell, I spent the first six or eight years in the program fishing people out of the ocean. Monkeys, chimpanzees, astronauts. <laughs> it can be done. But why now would we go back to fishing monkeys out of the goddamn ocean? <laughs> I tell that to my wife. She says, how come you're so smart and they're so dumb? <laughs> I said, I don't have an answer. Any event, this is a way you can go back to the moon. It's not the way NASA chose to go back to the moon in 2004 when we had that dumb policy change of 2004. NASA came back and said, I'm going to build Apollo on steroids. I'm not going to have a Saturn V, I'm going to have a Saturn V and a Saturn 1B. And I'm not going to go down to the limb with to the surface of the moon with a lamb that carries two people, I'm going to take a heavy lamb. So I want an Aries 1 and an Aries 5 and a heavy lamb and an Orion, and I'm going to go back to hell with the country. You, I'm going to go back and spend 10% of your money. <laughs> That's called constellation. Pew, down the drain. That's where we've been for the last seven years and we dumped twelve and a half billion dollars down the drain. You see, I'm retired. I don't have to be polite like Howard. <laughs> I don't have to say, NASA's going to do whatever we, they do and we'll do whatever they say. Hey, I worked in NASA, I worked in industry, and I'm not trying to sell anyone anything. We've been dumb for the last seven years. Just that simple. You come out here, you can see, I can add, it takes 60% of the energy that it would take to go to the moon just to go to low Earth orbit. If I keep the shuttle, I'm 60% of the way back to the moon just keeping it. Now all I gotta do is put a little propulsion element in the shuttle or send it up separately, another living place, add another 35% of energy, and I'm out to geo. I can go out 22,000 miles. Someone says, what in the hell do you want to go to geo for? I said, I don't know. They do communications at geo. It'd be a great place to generate solar power. You could send it off to the North Sea and dig for an oil, or you could send it to Afghanistan if they wanted electricity over there. Maybe in 50 years, it'll be cheap enough to put one up there and send it to the city of Houston. I don't know, what in the hell you want to go to GEO for? But I bet you've told NASA to tell you why I go to GEO, they give you a list of things that long, saying great things you could do at GEO. After GEO, out in space, there are a bunch of things, and you didn't get this in high school physics. There are a bunch of things called Lagrange points. That's a place in space where there are five Lagrange points around any two large bodies where the gravity is such that it will hold that body in that proximity to the other two bodies as those two bodies do their thing. So there's a place between here and the moon called 
Earth, Moon, L1. If you go from Geo on up to Earth, Moon, L1, you can park stuff there without spending the energy to go down to the surface of the moon and come back. It takes a lot of energy, cost to do that. You have to build a lamb or do something. Now what's so fancy about L1? L1 is a intersection point on the celestial highway where it's efficient to stay on that highway if you're going to ultimately go to Mars. So what we'd like to have in the future is a good truck spot at L1. So had NASA been smart enough in 2004 to pick this way of going back to the moon instead of the dumbass thing they did to grab Apollo again, we could have taken $12 billion and we'd be at LEO today. I mean at GEO. You could easily have people at geosynchronous orbit today doing things. And we'd have a stable shuttle, we'd have a stable manned spaceflight program, and a hell of a bunch of people here wouldn't be losing their job. How come I'm so smart and they're so dumb? Can't answer that. Let me, uh, George, I don't know how much more time I can take here. Let me do this real quick. Go through the chart. You know what the shuttle can do. I don't use the plight terminology that Howard uses. But let me set a reference point for you. I wasn't very happy when we named the shuttle the space shuttle. You know, it's a connotation little shuttle bus you catch from here to there. But I wasn't smart enough to straighten our PO people out and we called it space shuttle. We also called it space transportation system. Well, it's part of a space transportation system. And it's, it's a shuttle in this sense my terms. It's an 18-wheel extended cab work vehicle. Now you hear about the uh, Russian Soyuz. The Russian Soyuz is a taxi cab. The Orion, Ares 1 Orion, was a taxi cab. Taxi cab, you call it up, pay it money, and it'll take a couple people somewhere. If you're running Houston Power and Light and you've got a bunch of electrical towers out there to maintain, do some work, do something, you want a work vehicle. You don't want a goddamn Volkswagen to run out there and back. Now, someone comes in and says, I can take care of your business at Houston Power and Light. All you got to do is give me some money and I'll build you a safe taxi. You say, well, tell I'm on a taxi. I got to maintain a goddamn power tower. Oh! Don't you want to go to space? Well, yeah, I'd like to go to space with something like the shuttle, and there's what it does. Twelve things. I could have put 20 things on that far. Power's going to sit here and compare the shuttle to Orion in Earth orbit is ridiculous. Orion is a taxi cab. The shuttle is a work vehicle. You hear things, Howard used the word progress. How many people know what the progress is? Hey, surprise. The Progress is a pickup truck without any people in it. Think of that. It's a pickup truck without any people in it. And we're a spacefaring nation. We're a spacefaring nation with taxi cabs and pickup trucks. How come I'm so smart and everyone else so dumb? George, I'll save some time here. 1970 to 72, the office I ran or managed here at, space, at the Johnson Space Center with a hell of a lot of help, went through all kinds of vehicles. I mean, we studied everything. We studied straight wings, swept wings, liquid boosters, solid boosters. We studied it all. And I can stand here and talk for you for hours on this. We don't need to do that. We came down to a vehicle that we could afford to build and did what we wanted to do, and it's still a hell of a good vehicle. <coughs> Let me, we went from up there at the left. People started in 1970 when I joined the program. They had what they called a two-stage fully reusable vehicle. And boy, everyone was happy with that. The only thing I can say nice about the two-stage fully reusable vehicle is it fit the bureaucracy. It was a great big booster for Marshall to build, great big orbiter for JSC to build, and everyone was happy. It was a dumb vehicle, and it cost too much. And 
I'm kind of glad we didn't have all the damn money that people wanted. We came down in this lower right corner and built what you now know as a shuttle. The orbiter here is 120 feet long. Uh, Two-stage fully reusable, 220 feet long. All of the cryogenic propellant was stored inside of that two-stage fully vehicle. Storing liquid hydrogen at minus 400 degrees is a tough job. They're still having trouble with it on the tank. And we put it in a simple tank that we knew how to build at Michu. We maybe could have put the insulation inside the tank rather than out. But the insulation job is an easy job to fix. Let me tell you the benefits of the vehicle we built. We put all the propulsion elements down at the bottom so you could light everything off before you left the pad. We can light the liquid engines before we light the SRBs, make sure everything's working, let it go. You also get the performance out of the liquid engines, the high performance engines all the way. Also, you can remove the human part of the shuttle hit it with a chopping block in front of the engines and put a unmanned section, whatever you want to put, whether it's a big cargo element. Howard called it the side mount. We used to call it the shuttle C when we developed this computer. This vehicle has tremendous versatility and the country can get what it wants to go back to the moon if it'll build on this vehicle. This vehicle's got you 60% of the way to start with and they can do it for the kind of money I've talked about. Now one final thing. Those of you that look every now and then and see a shuttle landing or see it flying around the country on the 740 saying, oh, I know all about the shuttle. The shuttle program is an iceberg. All you have seen is the tip of the iceberg. There are billions of dollars worth of infrastructure behind the shuttle program. I think the country will have its head up and locked if it throws that infrastructure away and goes back to hiring a taxi cab from the Russians for a while and goes off on a tangent of building a great big launch vehicle and a great big spacecraft when they can't even tell you what the hell they want to do with it. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. I'm not trying to win a contract. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for that interesting perspective. Uh, our next speaker, our final speaker, is uh, George Jeffs. And George uh, is an individual that has had a great career in the aerospace industry. He was a chief engineer on Apollo for uh, North, North American Aviation and later Rockwell. Uh, he was involved in all their spacecraft that they built uh, involved in the shuttle and ended up uh, president of uh, their Rockwell Space and Energy uh, uh, group and uh, has stayed involved uh, even today and uh, is still uh, still flying. He flies his own helicopter up to Oregon quite frequently and uh, uh, he's still advising uh, uh, the aerospace community in, in a number of areas. So let me turn it over to George Jeffs in California. Can you hear me okay? Um, some time ago, uh, I put together a summary paper that was published, uh, and most of the points that were in that paper have been covered by previous speakers, so I'll not belabor those. The only one that uh, I wonder whether we've taken full advantage of is the uh, uh, so-called landing with dignity uh, element of the uh, uh, orbiter, uh, and that, of course, relates to true reu reusability. Uh, I spent uh, quite a bit of time trying to uh, refly uh, flown Apollos, and I found it to be uh, an impossible task. It was so time consuming and so expensive to requalify and try and prove that that hardware was replyable. Uh, it didn't uh, pan out to be any, any kind of a, an option at all. And I doubt whether it will be in the future. It's also interesting to note that a lot of the loads that go into the vehicle uh, are from uh, slapdown, 
and uh, so many brackets and so on in that spacecraft have to be designed for 20 G's that it adds all, all adds weight to this thing, which gets me to the next point, the major one, and that is that I think it's, uh, first let me preface that by saying it's uh, my North Star has always been to While we're waiting, let me make one point that I meant to make, and that is, if you remember when Skylab was coming back to enter the Earth's atmosphere, how excited everyone got about it might hit this city or it might hit that city. I was program manager for Skylab, to be perfectly candid. We put it up there and we decided to take the calculated risk. It wouldn't hurt anyone when it came down. We did not have a plan to bring it down. The space station right now weighs over a million pounds. We worry about a comet coming in and hitting the car. A million pound comet ought to worry the hell out of us. It's a million pound comet. Now, NASA may can figure out they can use a taxi and a one-way pickup truck and keep the space station up there safe. I hope they can. In my judgment, the country will be in a much better position to defend itself on having put the space station up there if it keeps the shuttle and keeps it from becoming a hazard. Because it can well become a hazard if the taxi and the, spa and the pickup truck can't do the job. Enough George, said. are you there wow. again? What? I'm here, but they're having trouble. Can you hear me at all? Yes, we can hear you. Go ahead. Damien, I'm not getting video. Let me let me let me go to the um, let me, let me go to the my my major views on this thing relative to it, kind of global views, and that is that it's a national mistake, I think, to stand down the the, uh, the uh, shuttle system. It's a wonderful tool that's been put in our hands to do at least two things with it that are major items uh, in the leg of the future, I believe. The first uh, uh, is, is how it might relate to deep space vehicles. Um, my guys through the years used to come to me with uh, proposals for on-orbit assemblies. Uh, I, I, I was, uh, like everybody else at that time, skeptical. I think that the um, uh, work that's been done with the orbiter and the crews and EVA and the assembly of the uh, space station uh, raises that option as a major option relative to deep space uh, craft of the future. The Apollo and the shuttle systems uh, are both basically designed for re-entry. They are really manned re-entry systems is what they are. They're not really spaceships. They are, they are the kind of elements of an architecture, but the spaceship itself is one that I believe is going to be uh, spend its life in space. And the shuttle, as a to and from article, enables us to uh, do essentially, uh, uh, essentially that. We don't have to design the spaceship of the future for reentry any more than we designed the ISS for reentry. And in a sense, the ISS is more an element or a representation of the spacecraft of the future, real spaceships. Uh, than the uh, that shuttle uh, or the uh, or the Apollo. Um, I, I for for many years were concerned about uh, if we go into deep space with those kinds of systems uh, like an Apollo system, um, that what a penalty it is to carry all that wasted uh, payload uh, with you uh, throughout deep space such as uh, re-entry heat shields, uh, parachutes, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, how light we could make that system much lighter if we build it in orbit. The problem is that we've got to provide a, a retro system for it to come back. But I think that's the future. I can't imagine, I can't imagine people spending uh, years in space and even more of that in the future in confined volumes that are dictated by re-entry. And that is represented by Apollo and shuttle. Uh, you've got to have more of the kind of living spaces that you have in the ISS in order to make anything like that practical in my mind. The present shuttle system
can be a major link in research programs leading to pathfinders for uh, such uh, a spaceship. And I think we should take advantage of that and do that. The second item that has been of uh, great interest to me is the use of uh, and the, the basis of uh, a space line with the uh, shuttle, which has been discussed somewhat. Uh, but never will the United States have a better opportunity to enter into a space line. It's certainly the foundation is better than when um, uh, uh, Boeing got involved with others in the establishment of the airlines in the first place on one contract for mail. Uh, the fact that we have uh, flown so many missions and are so far down the learning curve uh, makes that opportunity real. We're certainly past, well past the infant mortality stages that future systems will have. We'll never have a better chance to put together a space line, uh, i.e. quote airline space line, than we've got right now. Not only from the point of view of maturity of the vehicle, but from the point of view of material, ma maturity of the operating teams. And that's been discussed. Uh, there are two things. Uh, there are two things about the space line that uh, probably need more uh, investigation, uh, if in fact we can get it off the ground. And uh, one is credibility of the uh, USA to operate it, and uh, by that I mean to take over NASA's role in the operation. Uh, toward that end, um, I would think uh, something like a. Um, a, 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 an overview group to report at the flight readiness reviews uh, composed of um, Boeing and Lockheed people as kind of an independent but not truly independent verification group. And I think that that could probably be something that would uh, assuage the concerns of boards of directors and otherwise in supporting uh, this kind of an activity by a, a company. And uh, the other thing about it is, is a, a, a wise guy at uh, North American Aviation used to say years ago, before you go running off with your space line, show me your purchase orders. So I heard in some of the discussions that there's a lot of uh, work going on in the marketing arena, the, uh, the set of uh, how this system is going to pay for itself, uh, and develop into a real space line. Uh, needs to be uh, really vetted out. Um, I think that's about, in consideration of the fact that it's getting pretty late for everybody, I think that's about all I'd like to contribute. George? Well, it's uh, run a little later than we had uh, planned on it, but uh, maybe we could have a few questions if there are, are some out there. And uh, please wait until you get the microphone to ask your question because uh, we'll need that uh, in order for it to go on, on record. Here we go. Question for Mr. DeCastro. You mentioned one of the shuttles had flown, I think you said, 34 out of a projected life of 100. Where do we stand on the uh, remaining life of the other two shuttles? Uh, there are 30 three flights on Endeavor, I believe, or 33 on Atlantis, and 29 on the other one. So the Discovery has flown more than any at 39. Let me make a comment on that uh, lifetime issue. When we were writing the proposal for the orbiter and integration support contract going out to build the shuttle, or the part of the shuttle that the orbiter involved. We had a little debate of what kind of lifetime to put in there, because this, is, this isn't a commercial airplane that takes off and lands 30 times a day. We discussed what is really going to set the lifetime of this thing. And frankly, we could not point to any real thing that set the lifetime. So we said, let's put 400 in there. That'll be far enough out, it won't be a problem for anyone. If someone asked me how I would figure the lifetime of the shuttle today, the way it's being used, I don't know how we could do it. Now, to say it can do 100 flights, I, I'm not sure it couldn't do 200. 
The 400 is not a magic thing. No one knows how to set lifetimes. You have to worry about the soft goods. You have to worry about if you've got a tank that depends on structure mechanics, you have to pressurize that tank so often. Under good engineering supervision, there's nothing that sets a lifetime for the shuttle that I know of. Hey, Bob, uh, it's great to uh, hear you talk. I'm one of those people that came from Langley, like you, uh, not too long ago. And I bet you didn't know that uh, when I decided to become an astronaut, I talked to George, and he said, why don't you leave that library and come to do real work here at JSC? <laughs> he called J Langley a library. But in, after, after the accident, I think what we really realized, one of the things we realized was how much we needed the researchers at those research centers. I don't believe we'd be flying right now if it wasn't for the good work that those people did in research and development. And I think one of the things that I've noticed that's changed a lot since the, uh, since the NASA that you knew and the NACA that you knew, and that was the culture. And John Hobolt came up with the Lunar Orbit Rendezvous, and, but, and, but it took a big man like Werner von Brunt to say, you know what? that's a better idea and change that around. And I don't know that we have those kinds of leaders that we have and we have a much different culture that we have. And, and that's all I wanted to say about that. But the one question I have for Howard DeCastro is, along the lines I know something a little bit about, uh, and that's reusable, reinforced carbon carbon and the wing leading edges. We had a serious problem with the wing leading edges. I'm not talking about the foam impact. I'm talking about when my vehicle came back, we noticed a major anomaly, okay, and it was a systemic problem with the wing leading edges, and we had to change out 12 of them. We had other problems with wing leading edges on other orbiters, okay. Now, I happen to know that rayon, the fiber that is used to build those wing leading edges, is no longer in production. I don't know if there's any available. And we're all out of spares for reinforced carbon-carbon wing leading edges. It's a very fragile system. It relies on 40 thousandths of an inch of silicon carbide coating on that wing leading edge. So what I would ask you is we're going to have to determine, a, a, come up with a different material. And this material is more of a, to make this material is more of an art than a science. And we've learned a lot over the past 30 years with the orbiter. How are we going to manufacture the leading edges that we're going to need to continue to fly the orbiter? Well, of course, you know way more about the wing leading edge material than I do, but we have no intention of manufacturing additional reinforced carbon carbon. Um, the plan that we would have to fly the shuttle commercially at the moment only has about 10 to 12 flights. Those 10 to 12 flights would use the reinforced carbon-carbon leading edge that we have today. It would use the extra that we, we do have spares, especially for the hot section, as you know. And we, you're shaking your head, no, we do have spares for the hot section. And we have, a, and the ex-orbiter guy sitting right in front of you there is nodding his head, yes, so you guys ought to talk. <laughs> the, uh, we're, we also would uh, set down discovery. Now I'm getting into things I wasn't going to talk about, but we would set down discovery and we'd have the wing leading edge from discovery as additional spares. Another thing we would do if we flew longer, uh, I told you that, that we had done everything the CAIB thought was necessary to do. Something we haven't been able to do is go into the vehicles and cut into parts that we would Otherwise, we, we need them. We can't cut into them. So we can go into actuators and cut in once we set discovery down and see how those actuators actually have aged if there's any problem associated with them. We can cut into other parts of the vehicle and learn more from a vehicle that's down than we have ever learned from the leading life issues and the, uh, the way we've looked at the vehicles in the past. George, is it... Am I allowed to ask a question? Uh, well, let's see if somebody else out to, has any more questions. I have a question. I'm curious to know more about the business case for a commercial shuttle. Are we talking about a monopsony where the government is the only customer? And how is 
a commercial shuttle substantially different from the way we fly shuttle today? How is the cost different? Well, those are really great questions, and I have to be a little careful about getting into our proposal here, but um, the, the shuttle program, the team that works together uh, has, in many cases, more people than it really needs to do its work. It's still a, a number of different companies. As we bring those companies together in a commercial vein, we would be able to reduce some of the redundancy, the redundancies that we think are unnecessary of people watching people, watching people do work, but still maintain the level of quality that is absolutely necessary for a s accepted risk level in flying the shuttle. But to your point about who the customer is, NASA is the customer to begin with. There's no question about it. Uh, as I said, NASA owns human spaceflight. But there are other customers. Uh, there are folks who would pay for a ride in the shuttle, just as they pay for a ride in Soyuz. So there's some opportunity for revenue that way. Uh, there are commercial satellites that we might be able to repair, or a group of commercial satellites. You could put five or more, depending on their size, in the shuttle and launch them. Uh, you get into a little problem there because we would be competing with Lockheed Martin and Boeing, who are our member companies, and they wouldn't like to see us take business away from them. So we'd have to do it in a way that, that made sense to Boeing, Lockheed, and that consortium. Uh, we have yet to investigate all of the opportunities for commercial. Perhaps the international partners would pay more for rides. Right now, NASA pays for their rides to and from. So there are revenue opportunities. I wish I could tell you the business cases come together, but Bill Capel sitting in the audience here is still working on it, and we're, we're a ways from it. But what Howard is referring to is if he opened up the shuttle to uh, carrying satellites like it once did, uh, Lockheed, Martin, and Boeing are also in the satellite carrying business. But uh, the only business they've been able to acquire is government satellites because they can't compete on the world market because our launch vehicles are too expensive. Uh, with a shuttle and with an ability to carry a number of satellites, you would probably make the U.S. launch vehicle industry more competitive again on the world market. But uh, that would shake, take a change in the policy relative to what the shuttle can do. And also uh, being able to compete internationally. Yes. This is for anyone uh, on the panel who wishes to respond, but uh, uh, while we're all familiar with uh, Reagan's uh, strategic defense initiative in the 80s, uh, the Space Wars program, um, do you feel that the uh, space weapons platforms will be a presence in the next, say, 10 years of America's involvement in space programs? Absolutely. I'm a Marine. <laughs> <laughs> That, that's, uh, I don't mean to make a joke of that question. That is a very serious question, and that's a question that would be answered at the national level by people that have way, way, way more information about its need, its requirement, and its capability than we are able to answer. Thank Sorry. You. Paul made a very compelling case for if you want to go to the space station, why you need the shuttle. I mean. I mean, the taxi cab example is a, a classic one. I think one of the problems uh, in terms of the, the political and public support for this, the reason why it's easy to chop the legs off of this is the bigger question, which is why send humans into space in the first place? And I think that well, the politicians don't know the answer to that. What you're saying, why are you so smart and they're so dumb? I don't know, but one of the aspects is we can't answer that question and we haven't helped them. If you work with or for NASA, it's an obvious answer. If you don't work with or for NASA, it's a tough time to explain it. And I think what we need to do is come up with ideas of how to transition the ISS from being something that we're afraid to shut down, which I think is what's happening right now, to something that we want to maintain and use and build upon. And that's where I think the innovation comes. And once you've got that goal, humans in space is a natural, and then going from low Earth orbit to 
other planets becomes the next obvious step, I think. And I'd I just like to know what you think about how we go about doing that, uh, making that case to our politicians and to our public so that we can keep these sorts of things going. Well, I, I think, uh, you know, the, the station for many years was being constructed, and, and now that uh, it's essentially completed, uh, you have a number of laboratories up there, and you have a crew of six uh, you know, doing the science. So, uh, you know, I firmly believe that uh, given that opportunity that uh, answers to your question, uh, you know, will come out. We know there's a variety of uh, medical and, and uh, processing type uh, research being done there, and, uh, uh, you know, they, they haven't solved uh, any serious significant problems yet but they're uh, you know working on a, on a variety of, uh, of, of medical salmonella is one that i know for a uh, for a fact that uh, they believe they have uh, you know solved uh, or found a cure uh, using research they've done on space uh, and the space station so so it's uh, you know you, we finally have the the laboratory up there to, to do the science and, uh, and and one would hope that uh, we'll be seeing more coming out of that in the near future you, you asked about why we go to space. Um, you have the answer to that, I think. We want to go to space because we need to go to space over a period of time. But for, for those of you who are not familiar with the Hubble deep field, let me just tell you a quick, quick uh, story. If you hold a dime at arm's length and look through the area that that would photograph, Hubble has taken two pictures. And they've, they've picked places that are completely devoid of anything that you can see. And they are called the Hubble Deep Field. Look them up on the internet. One of them has 3,000 images. The other one has 10,000 images. The 3,000 and the 10,000 images that they picked up in those black areas are galaxies. They represent one half of one millionth of the universe. And in each of those galaxies are billions of suns and planets. Somewhere out there, somewhere out there, there's another Earth. There's another place that we can, we can occupy. Now it's light years away, and none of us are going there. When I first heard about it, I said, well, that proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that we are the only intelligent life in the universe. That was a joke. <laughs> we, need, we need to keep looking. Howard, I understand there was a uh, Space Act agreement from several years ago that was looking at trying to take the external tank the rest of the way to orbit and utilizing it for various purposes. I was wondering, one of you had looked at all at the business case of uh, using an external tank and the feasibility of going ahead and doing what that Space Act proposal had uh, in it, or Space Act agreement had proposed. I, I am just casually familiar that, in fact, that it was being looked at, but, uh, but I have no, you know, don't recall seeing any further. I mean, the tanks, uh, you know, are, are just aluminum tanks, so you'd have to certainly outfit them with something and, uh, and arrive at. I don't know what the, the study entailed, but, uh, uh, you know, once again, that, you talk about innovation, you know, there's an opportunity for innovation. Well, the, the proposal did include outfitting them, and it did look at uh, the value of the uh, transportation cost alone of putting that much material on orbit, which is otherwise being disposed of. Well, as Bob said, you know, it's, it's, it, it made the first 100 miles, and that's the, the most expensive 100 miles. So, We have time for one more question. All right, thank you. To be too simplistic, but about 132 flights, two fatal disasters, that's about one and a half percent. Don't you think this is too high of a risk to take? And what should we do to, to mitigate this risk before we proceed? I didn't hear the question clearly. I, George, apologize. I don't want to sit here like a dummy, but I can't hear a word that the people are saying at mics. Well, I have to admit that I'm over 70, so I don't hear too much. Can you, can you hear me now? I yes, can hear you now. What I said is 132 flights uh, and uh, two fatal disasters. That's about 1.5%. Don't you think this is too high of a risk to take? And what should be done before we can proceed to mitigate this risk? Ec excellent question. The question was, we have flown 132 times 
and we've lost two vehicles and 14 crew members. And before that, an Apollo uh, 3 with Grissom, White, and Chafee. Uh, is this too high a price to pay? Uh, I'm not an astronaut. It's not for me to answer, perhaps. Uh, I know a lot of them. There are some in the audience, and I would tell you that they are still volunteering to fly because they believe in the value. Now, should we make it safer? Absolutely. Everything we can possibly do to re safe is a bad word with space. Uh, they don't fit very well together. When you're when you're moving millions of pounds of things off the Earth and out of Earth's gravity, to say that it's safe is really a stretch. So is it relatively safe? Is the risk known? Is it reliable? Is it worth doing? Uh, I think it is, and I think right now flying the shuttle like we're doing for another three flights or another 30 if that's what is required or another 100. If you approach each flight with, the, with a known risk and understanding it as best you can, then if we do lose someone, I still think it would be worth the risk. Let me make a comment, Howard. You said we should do everything possible to make it safe. No, to reduce the risk, to make it as safe as we possible. We shouldn't do everything possible. If you don't want to get hurt riding a motorcycle, don't get on a motorcycle. If you don't want to get hurt going to space, don't go to space. There will never be a time when going to space does not entail risk. And you can't do everything impossible and make the risk go to zero. If you're running a program, you have to make judgments. Safety is a judgment call. The program manager has to decide whether what you're doing is worth the risk, the gain worth the risk. People go around using the word safety. They're generally talking about risk. They seldom talk about what you're trying to do. It certainly wasn't safe, the settlers that settled the western part of this country. It was not safe. But they thought it was safe, and they did it. It was risky. The Indians would get to you if you weren't careful. Going to space, the country is going to have... I shouldn't say this. My wife were here, she'd make me shut up. But we're going to have to get over going into national mourning for two and a half years when we lose someone in space, or we're not going to be a spacefaring nation. Now think about that. I'm not belittling the people who lost their life in space. We never had trouble finding astronauts who wanted to make the flight. And they knew the risk. We knew every single failure point that was in that vehicle. And I signed off accepting every single failure point in that vehicle, saying I understood it, they understood it, and it's worth the risk. So you go around wringing your hands and we're going to hurt someone, Let's get out of the space business. Well, let me give you my perspective as somebody that's accepted that risk four times. Uh, I did believe in the mission. I also, uh, by uh, working in the space program, you know the people very well. And uh, this team that Howard talked about earlier, you know them very well. Uh, you work with them, you train with them, and you know the process they're using, and you know their dedication and, and the way they approach it. And uh, that gave me confidence. Not only that, uh, there are a variety of things, uh, ma uh, failures, uh, that can happen on the shuttle that the crew has complete capability, if they are well trained, to handle and, uh, and solve the problems. And uh, every time I flew, I felt totally confident, not only in the team that got the vehicle ready, but also the crew I was with, that we could handle every failure uh, that uh, we had the capability of handling. Now, both the Challenger and the Columbia were failures that the, the crew could do nothing about. And I equate that to driving down the freeway and the 18-wheeler loses control and smacks me. Now, I don't stay off the freeway because that could happen. And uh, that is, you know, was basically my approach to flying in space. I believed in the mission. I believed in the people that did it. I believed in the crew I was with. And anything beyond that, like Bob said, if you don't like the odds or you don't like that risk, stay home. I was chief of the astronaut office for six years. I never forced anybody to get in that shuttle. Well, thank you, Dan.
Well, thank you all for uh, for coming. If you have uh, more questions, I'm sure that uh, these three uh, will stay around for an hour or two and answer them. Uh, <laughs> and uh, George, you're safe out there probably, but we'll give him your phone number. <laughs> so thank you all for coming. There is a, there is a reception outside, uh, so please join us for the reception outside.